So let's get started. So thank you so much for including our paper on the program. This is trying to work with uh, Christine, uh, who is also here in the audience. So um, what do you want to look at uh, in this paper is how does uh, DeFi to DeFi decentralized exchanges compare with traditional exchanges? And most exchanges that we have today are based on the some kind of limit order book. And this is in general viewed as the best way to provide liquidity. But there in DeFi, there is a new form of liquidity provision that came up and these are liquidity pools. And in this uh, paper, we want to examine a little bit how these liquidity pools work and uh, show that they can in some times dominate the limit order market setup. So we showcase this based on, on the Uniswap system and uh, Uniswap is a large decentralized uh, swap system. It's part of the building block of DeFi, one of the main Lego blocks that a lot, of, a lot of other DeFi protocols interact with. And there is many clones of um, Uniswap. Uniswap is an open source protocol that is put out there. And a lot of people decided this is a great idea. Let's copy that and launch it under different names. So we have Sushi Swap, uh, a pancake swap, which is mainly running on the Binance Smart Chain. And there's a lot of other clones around there who all pretty much follow the same system. So the trading volume is huge. So I just looked this up and uh, now I forgot my cheat sheet on my uh, spot here, but I think this is about, the daily trading volume is about $2 billion. And at the moment, the posted liquidity on uh, Uniswap is about $8 billion. And in total, if you add up a few of those DeFi exchanges, there's about $20 billion locked up in this kind of system. So this is a new model of liquidity provision. And we argue that the kind of risk of being picked off as a market maker uh, is mutualized in these liquidity pools. And that's what makes them very successful and also differentiates them from the uh, traditional limit order book. So let me talk a little bit about how uh, this works. So Uniswap launched on the Ethereum blockchain uh, as uh, this uh, decentralized swap facility. We, in this paper, focus on version one and version two of the protocol. Very recently, version three has launched, but uh, we have not looked into that yet. First of all, it's an order of magnitude more complicated to analyze the data. And second, uh, the time series is pretty short and it's set up also in a slightly different way. So this Uniswap is all cluster of different liquidity pools. So it's tens of thousands of different liquidity pools that exist in the Uniswap system alone. And then we have all these other pools out there from different protocols. So there's something called a factory contract. And if I create a new token or if I have a new token, then I can just evoke that factory contract and that factory contract will deploy one of those liquidity pools or trading venues for me. And so in a sense, we can view this more in traditional markets as no listing requirements. Anybody can come up and create uh, a new liquidity pool. And uh, so therefore uh, this establishes a trading venue. How do these liquidity pools work? The agents, anybody uh, can deposit liquidity into a liquidity pool. So what you do is you uh, usually, in our example, we have uh, a liquidity pool that contains ETH and token, but it could also be two tokens that trade directly against each other. And so you deposit those two tokens in the right proportions in the liquidity pool so that the ratio of the two tokens matches the market. So anybody can deposit, contribute to this inventory in this liquidity pool. I'm a liquidity provider and Uniswap myself too. I had to try this out, of course. And then in return, you receive a liquidity token that is kind of your receipt that you have contributed to this share. So now this composition of the pool might change as people trade against this inventory that's in this liquidity pool. The pool also collects fees. So the way this pool evolves over time might be different. There might be a different ratio of ETH versus token in that pool over time. 
And but if you have this liquidity token, you can at any time also withdraw liquidity from this liquidity pool. And when you cash in your liquidity token, you obtain this, uh, whatever is in that pool uh, at that time in that ratio um, uh, when you withdraw liquidity from this pool. So if you look at pricing, so for a very, very small trade, you trade essentially at the exchange rate that is defined by the pool, which is the ratio of ETH to token. Uh, and for larger trades, uh, the price that you get is determined by this bonding curve, which follows this kind of equation here, where we say that the amount of ETH in the pool, E and the amount of tokens in the pool uh, is where you start. And then you trade whatever you trade in and out in ETH or in and out in tokens has to be such a way that any of the point after the trade, uh, this product is the same as before the trade. So if you set those deltas to zero, then we have the current state of the world and for whatever trading balance uh, we do, this equation has to be satisfied. So graphically, this looks like this. So our pool starts off here at the red dot uh, with some inventory of ETH and token. And now if I want to sell tokens to the pool, uh, what I do physically, I send these tokens to the smart contract, which is a little computer program that's deployed on the uh, blockchain. And then the smart contract sees that I get these tokens into the pool, the supply of tokens in the pool increases. How many ETH does the smart contract send me back? Well, we can see this graphically, the new point, the blue point must again lie on this bonding curve. And then we can see from this price difference here on the y-axis, how many ETH the smart contract sends me back. So just wanna say that this is totally uh, safe to do that. Whatever the smart contract is doing is publicly known. A lot of these protocols are open source. I can see that there's no code lines there that the smart contract will steal my tokens. And the, uh, we can also say that the, the settlement risk is zero because transactions on, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain are atomic. So they either execute as a whole or not at all. So we have built a little model to uh, analyze how does this kind of framework compare to a, a limit or the market. So we have some asset with a price of P0 and then two things can happen. Either there's no info, new information coming out. So the price stays pretty much the same. And uh, in this case, the liquidity trader, trader arrives in the market and trades an amount Q of units. It could also be an information event, in which case the value of the token either goes up or down. And um, in this case, and there's always some kind of arbitrageur out there who's looking for profitable trading opportunities. So this is one of the cases where the arbitrageur will come in. And if there is a change in the fundamental token price, then this arbitrageur will trade. Everybody is risk neutral in our model. So I don't want to go through the uh, model details, but just to give you an idea what we model, how we model the limit or the market in this kind of setup. So we have two competing liquidity providers uh, in this market, and uh, there's two states of the world. Either both of them provide liquidity in this market, and then they are very actively competing with each other to provide that liquidity. So, uh, they have a mixed strategy equilibrium of uh, limit orders that they provide to the market and they set on average break even. So in this scenario, the market makers don't make any money, but the liquidity providers in our limit order market can also invest in some kind of wasteful technology that gives them uh, um, a chance to become a monopolist. And the way we think about this is that you engage in some kind of high frequency trading, that you learn if the trade that is coming in is coming from an institutional investor. And if you see that the large institutional investor is trading, then you can cancel your limit order uh, and, and uh, not, not therefore trade with that, um, with that institutional investor. You learn some information faster than other people. Something like this. So the monopolist liquidity provider will then charge a very high spread and uh, will be profitable. 
but overall from a societal perspective this technology is wasteful but it's well worth it for individual liquidity providers to invest in this technology so we compare that to um to the uniswap market so how does trading work out there in our model so one thing to remember is that the liquidity providers earn a fee from every trade uh, that happens in this uniswap market so at the moment this is 30 basis points in uniswap what any trader has to pay to the pool so now let's come back to our two scenarios if there's no information event then a liquidity trader arrives and what the liquidity trader is doing it pushes the price from E0, T0 to E1, T1, just along this bonding curve that I showed before. And uh, what happens afterwards, an average assurer who is always present in the market sees that the price is out of equilibrium and pushes the price right back to red balls. Now, when we think about arbitrage in financial markets, we think usually that's a bad thing, but here this is actually a good thing because uh, the price gets pushed uh, back to its fundamental value. There's not really any problem for the liquidity providers in this case, because uh, if you remember, all the points are on the bonding curve. So the liquidity providers in this case have not really lost anything because uh, the price gets pushed out of equilibrium and then gets pushed right back to equilibrium. So the liquidity providers are exactly back in square one but they have earned two times the trading fee. So actually, in a sense, this was a good event for the liquidity providers because they earned some fee revenue. Now let's look what happens if there is a change in the true price. And of course, Uniswap is just a computer program and a computer program doesn't really know what's going on in the real world. So uh, the liquidity pool still quotes uh, the price E0, T0 when the true price is E1, T1. And so the price is stale. The arbitrageur will come in and say, uh, here's an arbitrage opportunity. Take advantage of this. The pool gets picked off and the liquidity providers lose out. Um, so this is the bad event for the uh, liquidity providers. So how do we um, characterize our equilibrium in, in these two markets? So in the limit order market, we have two situations. There's zero expected profit for the liquidity providers if both of them are competing. There's monopoly rents if they are not competing with each other. So uh, there is this incentive to invest in this wasteful technology to become a monopolist. And we figure out how much optimal investment is going on there and what prices and uh, uh, spreads are in the limit or the market model. In the uh, liquidity pool, uh, one thing, the equilibrium condition that we use here is that the fee revenue that these liquidity providers earn from trading, and you always earn a fee, either when you trade, when you get picked off, you earn a fee, but especially you earn a fee when these liquidity tra traders arrive, and then the arbitrageur has pushed the price back. So in any case, whatever happens, you earn this fee revenue, and this fee revenue uh, has to be equal to the risk of being picked off. One thing to note is that uh, the mechanism how this adjusts is the size of the pool. So this bonding curve, uh, if the inventory or, or the size of the pool gets larger, then this bonding curve gets flatter. So the price impact uh, is smaller. So if the pool is small, then we have a higher price impact so that changes the incentive for this arbitrageur to trade and how much to trade. And so that, that's kind of the equilibrium mechanism, how we can make sure that uh, there is an equilibrium where the fee revenue equals the taking off risk. So the pool size is stable. There's no incentive to move around. Uh, we come up with an equilibrium pool size uh, in this model and solve for that. So, one thing um, that is kind of noteworthy is that in, the, in this bonding curve market, I don't have to be very concerned what everybody else is doing. Because uh, if uh, another liquidity provider withdraws liquidity, what will happen is the price impact will change and that will change what 
uh, the optimal trading strategy of the arbitrage share. So I will, I myself as a liquidity provider don't have to be too much concerned about that. If I'm in a limit order market and uh, say Andreas and I are competing liquidity providers in the limit order market and we, Andreas figures out that Fidelity is gonna come in with a big trade and Andreas can cancel his limit order and he's fine and I'm left holding the bag and I have to uh, suffer the adverse selection cost. So in that sense, I have to be very concerned about how much Andreas knows what's going on in the market and whether he can see that fidelity is coming. And then I have to watch out uh, myself and invest in, in this technology. So in the limit order market is speaking off risk. Uh, I have to be very concerned about what the other market makers are doing, not so much in the liquidity pool. So we look at a bunch of transactions that we download from the uh, Ethereum blockchain. So we look at all uh, Uniswap, V1 and V2 uh, liquidity pools. We go to these factory contracts. We look how many pools were created. So we have about uh, 37,000 individual liquidity pools. A lot of them are obviously pretty small, uh, but there is uh, also a lot that are pretty big. So we look at all the transactions on these liquidity pools between uh, the start in 2018 and uh, uh, May 21. So this leaves us about 74 million transactions. We have about 1 million liquidity injections, 500,000 withdrawals of liquidity and uh, 45 million uh, trades. There's a few uh, complex transactions in there as well uh, uh, that I wanna talk about in a second. So looking at this data uh, is not very straightforward. There's a lot of very idiosyncratic things. Uh, so there is some copycat tokens. Of course, anybody, uh, there's the real, for example, USDC token, but because there's no regulation whatsoever in these markets, every, anybody can create the, US, the token and name it USDC. And so we do see in fact that there's quite a few fraudulent tokens in there. And the naive user who doesn't check the theorem, the correct the theorem address or uses a software that checks it for them and thinks, hey, this is a USDC token, buys the token and it's just a worthless copycat token. No. And so we see a bunch of those happening here. There's uh, a lot of other interesting um, events here, mostly that are involved with some kind of exploits uh, on other D5 protocols. So we see, for example, a huge uh, transaction here uh, on October 26 in, in 2020, an attack on Harvest Finance. Uh, the reason why uh, we see these large trades on Uniswap is that a lot of other protocols use the data from Uniswap as price information. Similar to stock traders looking at Bloomberg uh, to see what is the current stock price, a lot of DeFi protocols who can only look within the blockchain look at these decentralized exchanges uh, for price information. So uh, adversaries can exploit that, move the, push the price of that uh, decentralized exchange out of equilibrium. And then the, whatever other protocol, in this case, Harvest Finance would receive a distorted price feed and then make bad decisions and users can exploit that. So, uh, <laughs> There's a lot of these price manipulation attacks that we see that bring prices uh, out of whack. So there's a huge trade, for example, on, on Unibomb tokens. So Unibomb is a deflationary token that burns 1% uh, uh, on each transaction. And so what the um, adversary used here uh, was uh, the fact that this, if this gets traded back and forth very often within the same transaction, some other protocol did not properly update that uh, so many tokens were burned, and then he could use that uh, uh, to his advantage to exploit that other protocol. And so the price went up a lot, and this was registered by the other protocol because the supply of uniform tokens went down. So in this kind of world, 
when we measure volume, for example, it's also not very straightforward how to do that because there's no obvious number of air. If I trade apple tokens against banana tokens and somebody uh, does a huge exploit, and so the ratio of apple to banana tokens doesn't match anymore with how much an apple token costs in dollars and how much a banana token costs in dollars. You could have uh, in the short term situation where prices don't make a lot of sense. So what we try to do is we convert everything to ETH uh, and then convert ETH to US dollars in part because ETH is the most prominent token that a lot of other tokens trade against. Flash swaps also make uh, life a little bit more complicated. So what a flash swap is a flash loan and a token swap. What is a flash loan? Uh, you can uh, borrow a lot of money at the beginning of a transaction. And because we know that a transaction only happens as a whole or not at all, as long as you repay your tokens at the end of the transaction, you pose no real credit risk to the lender. So you borrow the tokens at the beginning of the transaction, you repay them at the end of the transaction. There is no credit risk involved because the lender knows that the repay and the borrow can either only happen together at the same time or not at all. So there's huge amounts of money being borrowed this way. Uniswap is one of the providers in this market and their unique feature is that you can repay in any combination of the two tokens that are in the pool. So you can do a kind of conversion of tokens uh, at the same time as you do the flash loan. So this uh, in line with a lot of the websites that we see like uh, uniswap.info, we include flash swaps in the volume calculation in our paper. There's a bunch of other interesting things like, uh, for example, somebody traded in March 21, a token called Scammy and then uh, created a Uniswap pool for that, borrowed $220 million in one of these flash loans and traded the token back and forth between the wallets to create a $5 billion trading volume on that day, then repaid the flash loan. Motive totally unclear. If this was somebody, somebody exploiting the, the ecosystem or, or trying to pretend to show to other people, hey, this is an interesting investment opportunity. There's a lot of effectivity in this token. If you wouldn't name that token scammy, right? If you want other people to invest in it. So it was pretty obvious that this is some kind of, I don't know, whatever that was, uh, uh, it was an interesting event that created a lot of volume. So we try to get rid of some of those events that are clearly kind of uh, outliers, uh, but a lot of the other um, flash swaps are included in our volume calculation. So if we look at the largest uh, liquidity pools, we see that uh, most of them trade uh, one kind of uh, US dollar stable coin against wrapped ETH. Uh, there's also a large pool of wrapped Bitcoin against wrapped ETH uh, in this market. And so a lot of these pools are pretty big. They have a lot of volume. So um, these are pretty large pools that we see here uh, in, in these protocols. So here is a graph of the trading volume over time. So the little blue part is Uniswap V1. It's barely visible at the beginning. And then we see that with version V2, uh, Uniswap really took off. The orange part here shows you the trading volume directly against red ETH. And we see that this is the majority of the trading volume in these markets. Um, the trading volume against other tokens is by far not as big. So this kind of graph shows you uh, the 50 largest pools in this market. And we see red ETH here at the center. And the thickness of the line represents the trading volume. So we do see that uh, almost every token is connected to red ETH. Some of these larger tokens also have direct pools with each other, but the volume in these pools is pretty small. Another prominent uh, participants here are the US dollar stable coins. We see DAI here and there's USDC up there. So the US dollar stable coins are very big. There's a lot of trading volume 
between red ETH and the, the dollar coins, but there's also a lot of tokens trading against uh, the US dollar coin. A lot of the pools that are not on this picture only trade against one other currency, and most often that is red. So in a way, this network structure represents a little bit the core periphery network structure that we see in a lot of financial markets uh, today. So let me talk a little bit about what we find about the size of these liquidity pools. So from our model, uh, we can predict that the pool size uh, is decreasing in the innovation of the price. So how, my, how much the price can move up or down and it is increasing in uniform trading. So we try to measure this empirically and say uh, this innovation in price, we proxy by volatility of the token. And we do find that pools in general for more volatile tokens are smaller. Um, we do control for airdrops of the, of the uni token that happened in some period of time for some selected liquidity pools in this market. Uh, we find that uh, investors correspond to this airdrop uh, incentives. But uh, what we also want to test is the prediction from our model is this uninformed trading. And so there's three ways we try to measure this. Of course, we never know whether a trader is informed or uninformed. Uh, so first we argue that there's only so many information events on a given day that come to the market. So, so only so much volume that will be traded on these events. So any extra volume beyond these ev information events must be uninformed trading. And so we do see that volume generally uh, uh, is associated with larger pools. We also see the number of trades have a positive influence. Again, in these liquidity pools, there's no incentive to chop up your trade into smaller pieces like there is in equity markets. So if you are an informed trader, you just go out there and you trade because the price impact is deterministic. And so uh, if there is a lot of trades, extra trades beyond the informational trades that must be uninformed trading and we see that uh, this is positively associated with pool size. What we also uh, probably most direct measure of uninformed trading are reversals. So when I, what I showed you before is that if a liquidity trader arrives and pushes the price out of equilibrium on this bonding curve, there is a strong incentive for an arbitrageur to come and push the price right back to equilibrium. So we look for these events in the data. We can see that if somebody trades and pushes the price in one direction and right afterwards, somebody else comes in and pushes the price right back we, in about the similar size, we can identify that in our trading data, we say, all these events reversals, and we find indeed that more reversals are associated with larger pool size. The liquidity provision in this uh, market is remarkably stable. So we know that in limit order markets, a lot of limit orders get canceled, that get provided, a lot of them around for a short period of time. We don't see any high frequency activity in liquidity provision uh, in these. Um, Uniswap markets. So to start with only very few uh, observations are liquidity withdrawals. Uh, we look at 800, we find 800 events where the same address adds and withdraws liquidity within 50 blocks. But these are very small. These are people just saying, hey, does this really work? What happens if I would add liquidity and withdraw liquidity? So the mean size of this uh, of these events is $150. So these are just people trying this out. If we look at larger ones, we only have 18 observations where deposit and withdrawal if liquidity is over $1,000 and within five blocks. So out of 45 million, 18 observations is very small. So we don't see any high frequency uh, liquid events in, in liquidity provision here. Uh, liquidity provision is very stable. And to illustrate this, we look at um, Black Thursday, so this is March uh, 19, uh, sorry, May 1921, and Ethereum dropped against the US dollar on that day by about 
just to illustrate, this is twice the size of the S&P drop at the 87 stock market crash. And we see that uh, the orange area here is the price uh, minute by minute of uh, ETH versus US dollars. And we see the huge drop here. Uh, the blue line corresponds to the aggregate withdrawals of liquidity from the uh, US dollar stable coin pools versus ETH. And what we see is that, first of all, so this goes with the right axis here, and we see that only about 17% of the liquidity was withdrawn during this event. So that's remarkably low. Uh, and most of that liquidity was withdrawn after the lowest point in the uh, price. So when the price was already coming back, then some of the liquidity was withdrawn. So at the really, the traders during this big market crash had ample liquidity to trade uh, against in, in these kind of markets. So liquidity provision was remarkably stable. So I looked a little bit at this, and one reason why uh, perhaps liquidity providers did not withdraw was that the fee revenue was really, really high during this event. So the liquidity providers earned probably five uh, times as much, as much fees during this uh, period of time than they normally would. So that kind of compensated them uh, for uh, these adverse selection costs. Thank you. So we look at, uh, uh, to compare how do these markets do relative to binary, uh, relative to limit order market, we look at cross-listed tokens that trade both on Binance and on Uniswap and have a reasonable large volume. Of course, this is, uh, these are two different animals, Binance, very different setup than uh, whatever is directly on chain. I also want to say that arbitrage takes time. So if you just want to do an arbitrage transaction directly, you would have to send your on-chain funds to Binance, wait for them to give you credit, then you can trade on Binance and then you have to withdraw them. So there's quite a process involved. So we were not expecting that prices match very closely, but actually they do match pretty well. So this graph shows you the, the size of the US dollar, uh, USDC ETH pool. This is the orange line in log scale that goes with the left axis. And the blue line is the pricing error between Binance and uh, the liquidity pool that goes with the right axis here. So the pricing error is close to zero uh, once the pool has reached a size of about 700 E. So once the pool is sufficiently large, then price impact in the pool is low. And then we can see that this works very well and tracks Binance prices uh, very well over time. So here's a random day I picked out here. And so uh, we see the Binance prices uh, uh, in blue versus Uniswap prices in orange, and uh, they track pretty well uh, over time. So this is high frequency. One, one question that is probably very relevant for institutional investors is price impact. We know that uh, in traditional limit order market exchanges, large institutional investors often complain that when they want to trade, that the liquidity evaporates and uh, they face a lot of price impact. Uh, what we see here is uh, the price impact um, that we measure on Binance is the blue line and that we measure on Uniswap is the orange line. We can also uh, theoretically predict uh, the price impact on Uniswap because uh, it's a deterministic function. So that's the green line that we see here. So this is again for the USDC ETH pool. And uh, two noteworthy observations. First, the price impact on Uniswap uh, is much lower than it is on Binance. And second, it's much more stable. Price impact on the limit order market is very volatile. And uh, this is also what our model would predict in this case uh, versus the price impact on Uniswap is very stable over time, which is really advantageous for those institutional investors who want to know uh, at what price they can really trade in this market. And it seems that people recognize this. So this is volume 
on um, in the USDC ETH market on Binance, which is blue, and Uniswap, which is orange. And we see that uh, initially when the Uniswap liquidity pool started, there was not nobody trading in, in Uniswap and Binance was the dominant market. And we see that Uniswap took over from Binance uh, which is the largest crypto exchange uh, here in this market. And the other kind of interesting observation is that trading volume is highly correlated in these two markets, also something we would not have expected initially. So we look at pricing errors uh, as well between those two markets and uh, a, a lot of uh, things make sense. For example, it's uh, easier to keep track if the pool size is sufficiently large, if the volatility of these markets is not too high, then it's easier that or it's more likely that the two prices are in sync. We also look at the relative volume and ideally what we find here is some kind of U-shaped pattern that the pricing area is lowest when the trading volume is more balanced between uh, Uniswap and Binance. So if there is more uh, an equal distribution between uh, between those two trading venues, then prices align better. We also find that when gas prices are higher, there's more pricing error, and uh, when the price impact is lower, um, there is uh, less price uh, less price difference between those two markets. So to keep in time, let me just conclude. I, I hope I could convince you that. Even though it sounds crazy that you let a computer program make a market without knowing anything what's going on in the world, that this new model of liquidity provision actually uh, works pretty well. So we argued that there's some, some benefit to this because in, in this uh, high frequency, um, in the traditional limit order market, investors have an incentive to invest in high frequency trading technology that is socially wasteful. Uh, just to carve out some kind of competitive niche. In a pool, uh, the picking off risks are mutualized. And so uh, the adverse selection costs are borne by all the liquidity providers. You don't have to worry about what the other liquidity providers do. So we do find that in some instances, liquidity pools can dominate the mineral markets. Most importantly for institutional investors, we argue that these pools have lower price impact and lower variation in price impact. Okay, that's it, thank you.